if, the, I'll think, if, if there aren't any online questions, I'll think of some. Which camera? You like your one? You, you can just have this. Okay, um, hello. Uh, so good, good evening all, um, and thank you for uh, coming. I'm told that I need to start with um, housekeeping. And usually that's about, you know, if you hear a, a fire alarm go, we're not planning to have any um, fire alarm today. And so please follow the signs to the exit and we congregate at the Exhibition Road, Imperial Road Junction, <coughs> so if there's a fire alarm. Um, so, my name is Washington Ocheng. I'm the current head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at Imperial, um, and it is my pleasure, my absolute pleasure, to chair this inaugural lecture today. And the lecture is going to be given by our own professor, Arav Majumda, who is sitting at the front here. And so whether you are here in person or joining us online, you are very warmly welcome and thank you for attending. I understand that some of you have crossed oceans and valleys to be here. 
been terribly pleasantly surprised to see some of you here. So a very, very warm welcome and thank you. It is fantastic to have you back after so many years. So to the, tonight I'm being ably assisted by Professor Kai Axhausen, who is our esteemed and honored visiting professor here at Imperial, who will give the vote of thanks. And Dr. Jan at the front here will help me with those who are actually attending online during the Q&A session. Uh, so Dr. Jan Zidatek is the Director of Technologies at the Lloyd's Register Foundation. We have a long history with the Lloyd Register Foundation, um, having supported us for so many years and being quite pivotal on Professor Majumda's career with us. So if I don't get the time to say it, thank you very much, and please do pass our regards back to the LRF. It's not really a tradition to allow Q&A at the end of inaugural lectures. Um, but being the brave man that Anab is, he has <laughs> agreed to a short or brief Q&A session. So please prepare your questions the, in here and also online. We will take them after the, the lecture. This is the bit I enjoy most because I, I get to tell you a little bit about Professor Majumdar, we all know him as Arnab, and he was born in Kolkata in India. I won't say how many years ago. Um, and this is interesting. He came to Britain with his parents. Arnab's dad is sitting at the front. Mr. Majumdar, very warm welcome to you. And he tells me, Arnab told me, that he had three pounds in his pocket when he got to the UK. Now that's an interesting in itself. Fast forward, he completed his bachelor's degree in civil engineering at the University of Manchester. I think it used to be called UMIS those days. Um, and before working for a couple of years in industry at Rundle, Palmer and Triton in highway engineering, so he's a highway engineer and transport, transportation planning associates. And there he was doing trip modeling in the London Docklands. So highway engineering, transportation planning, there's more to come in terms of his areas of expertise. He came to Imperial, he saw the light, and, <laughs> and I took his Master of Science in Transport at the Center for Transport Studies. And he liked it even more uh, so he stayed on to do his PhD. I think this is where I say that he introduced me to the task of supervising. So Arnab was, together with myself and the late Professor John Pollack, he was my first ever PhD student. So if I get emotional this evening, if you see some tears rolling down my cheeks, that's why. Um, it's a very, very special occasion for me as well having seen him through his doctorate and then through those many years in his career, to ascend to the chair at Imperial College London, which is no mean feat. I mean, getting to a professorship here, full professorship here, is quite an accomplishment in itself. So after completing his PhD, um, he was a postdoctoral researcher between 2002 and 8. He then became a lecturer in 2009. He was promoted to senior lecturer in 2015. He learned how to read in 2017 <laughs> and then became a full professor in 2021. So during his time at Imperial, Arnab has established himself as an international leader in the field of assessing human performance in transport operations, particularly relating to safety. So, you get from highway engineering, you go through transport planning, you then decide to do human factors. I remember a discussion I had with Arnab one time because uh, engineers didn't pay that much attention to the people in terms of human factors. And so we discussed this because he was interested in workload modeling, air traffic controller workload modeling, and he decided then to go and pursue an MSc in psychology. So Arnab is the resident, 
explicit an expert in human factors within the Department of Civil Engineering, and dare I say, across Imperial College London. Anab has worked very closely with, within government and industry across different modes to ensure that the results of his research have real world applications and impact. He's very passionate about making a difference in society. He's a true collaborator, working with everybody in a very inter, multi, and transdisciplinary kind of way. And he's even worked with people from the School of Medicine and across the social sciences. He has led collaborative research and co-authored publications with academic and non-academic colleagues from oh dear, New Zealand, Taiwan, Thailand, Norway, Iceland, South Africa, uh, receiving several awards on his way to those places, ending up in Europe via the United States of America. So Arnab is a chartered civil engineer since 2016 and a fellow of the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation since 2020. He has led the Lloyd's Register Foundation Transport Risk Management Center since 2010. The center has not only led to high impact transport research, but also led to multiple award-winning PhD graduates. Some are here tonight. And of course, those particular ex-graduates are serving with great distinction wherever they are, actually changing the world, and that is fantastic. So the high regard with which Anab Center is held was recognized by the Lloyd's Register Foundation with their award of Grant Holder of the Year in 2015-2016. Another no mean feat, another great achievement. So Anab has also been a valued colleague and leader in our department and across Imperial College London. So within the CTS, that's the Center for Transport Studies, he has been our examinations officer since 2010 and admissions tutor since 2018 for our then intercollegiate MSc in transport. So Anna has managed the transitions from in-person during the COVID-19 pandemic, online and back to in-person, which has been a truly trying time and did that ever so successfully and with great impact. In 2019, Anna was appointed as the college representative on the London Interdisciplinary Social Science Doctoral Training Program, otherwise known as the LIST DTP, in the role of deputy director. Again, he discussed it with me and I said, Anna, go for it. Um, I didn't actually count how many hours he would need for it, but, but needless to say that, again, serving, changing things with great distinction. He has since ensured greater engagement across Imperial of the LIST DTP with the focus on interface between social sciences and STEM and medicine and developed an internship program much valued by students across the LIST DTP. Don't worry, I'll get to it, I'll finish. Furthermore, working closely with his fellow directors at King's College London and Queen Mary University of London, Arnab has steadily, uh, as a steady hand and helped to shape a very effective forward-thinking forward doctoral training program, not only in terms of future research, but more importantly, the skills required by future doctoral students for successful careers in academia, industry, and government. So now, it gives me the greatest of pleasures um, to request Professor Anab Majumda to please step up and deliver your inaugural. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues, for attending uh, in person and online. Um, I was going to see my talk today about a journey given its transport, but let's be honest, nobody's been on any journey today with all the trains on strike. So let's stick to 
doing something simpler, making the world a safer place. Oh, is that the one? I see. Just because you're a professor doesn't mean you know how to click the right button. Sorry. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Engineering a safer world. Um, <clears throat> so, a quick warning uh, to you, because this presentation will contain images and information that might be difficult to view. Uh, I work in accidents. I work with uh, people doing dreadful things to others. But please bear in mind, I'm going to show you things about how we can analyze what's going on and how we can mitigate their effects so that we don't suffer from them too much in the future. Right, so I am in the Department of Civil Engineering. As Washington said, I'm a chartered civil engineer, so I really must, must know what that is. And, um, but not everybody in this audience is a civil engineer. Uh, some of you are in other fields. And therefore, I'm going to give an introduction which tells you what is civil engineering. Then it tells you even those who are civil engineers may not know too much about safety. So I'm going to tell you a little very brief uh, overview of that. And then even if you know about safety in civil engineering, you don't understand why it's so complicated for those of us in transport. So I'll give you that. But this is a primer. Bear with me for it. Um, but I'll start off with what is a civil engineer. This is very interesting for us in, in our section because we're going through a, a rebrand and re and I was thinking to myself, no, we can't be calling ourselves engineers until it was pointed out that's exactly what we are and what I am. So I went to the veritable institution of civil engineers, the American Society of Civil Engineers. What is a civil engineer? What do we do? So it's about everything that's built around us. Um, the Americans throw in a few more things like energy systems, cleaner environment, etc. But it's about buildings, um, infrastructure, without which it'd be very hard for us to live. Think, okay, I, I understand that. I don't, can't remember when I last designed a, an office or, or a bridge, but never mind. I, I understand what this is about. But what skills would I need then? So this is from the European Council of Civil Engineers. The red box is what I think I did in uh, my undergraduate. I, I know about mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, mat materials. I passed the materials lecture, indeed. Um, the exams and design, we, we do a lot of that, uh, group design projects. And increasingly, sustainability. Of course, it's important. The part in blue is when I went, well, I can't remember having done any social sciences or anything in particular about ethics as an engineer, but I'm supposed to be knowledgeable in that. OK, and, and what skills should we as engineers have? Civil engineers, basic engineering tools. Yes, I can do that. Learn about assets and master new technology. What, like virtual reality or uh, understand what artificial intelligence actually is? Right. No, I, 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 I'm not sure I have those kind of skills to the level they should be at. So today, I hope, in this talk, we'll talk a little bit about what's in the blue and what's in the green. The red, I assume, as engineers, you would expect us to know. But I'm not too sure about the other two. So let's go. Um, safety 101. As I say, not everybody who's an engineer knows the intricacies of safety. But we all kind of know what safety is, right? We, we bandy it around. Is it safe? Oh, this is safer than that. The, the trouble is, safety, how you understand it and then subsequently measure it, depends to some extent on what your view of safety is. For some, it's about following rules, right? A safety. This theory goes, if we all followed rules, there'd never be any accidents. Yes. Well, that's a simplistic view of the world. And, and you know, inveterate law, uh, rule breakers will say, well, who made these rules? You know, and in a complicated world, rules are a compromise. So is this really 
the kind of view you want to take? The second view is, well, actually, safety is the absence of any accidents. Now, I understand that. It, surely it's not safe to have any accidents. But is that so simple, though? And I say to you, having changed a light bulb, as an engineer, we have to do that once in a while, having changed a light bulb at home, teetering on the edge of a creaking chair, just about managing to change the light bulb. Yeah, I didn't have an accident, but it didn't feel safe. And God knows one day, you know, the, the chair won't bear the load. So, well, that's one way of looking at it. And the third way, perhaps quite common, is safety is taking acceptable risks. Got it. Some of you will have come in by car. Some of you will have cycled in. You would have taken a, a risk. You know, and risk manage. You'd have done some risk management and thought, you know, I know whatever I do, there's some risk involved. Here's the point. Do we really know about the risk? You know, um, financial risk managers, even they have imperfect information. What, who are we to know what are the risks involved? And what's acceptable? Who decides that? What is acceptable or not? So now we've got three layers of complications here about safety. So let's fall back onto our old friend, the Oxford English Dictionary, and it tells you uh, safety is very easy to define. It's a freedom from danger, injury, or damage. And interestingly, the tranquility of an operation and the fact it doesn't endanger the environment. You think, okay. And it also tells you, by the way, safety is a relative thing. So often I get asked by people, which is the safest airline? And you think, mm, should I travel by uh, whichever airline, you know, Aeroflot or some other airline or British Airways? And you think, well, yeah, you're, you're, which is the safest airline relative to what? You've got to have that relative part of it. Now we come to the third layer of difficulty because modern transport systems are highly complex uh, environments. What we see is when you look at the accident data from road to maritime to railways to aviation, in about 70% of them, you've got human involved, 70 to 80%. I'm being very careful to say they're involved and not causing because that's not the term. It's in a complex socio-technical system as transport is. Causation is a, is a difficult word to live with. What is a socio-technical system? Well, it's basically where people, human beings, interact with technology and procedures to give you a service. Those of you who flew in today will have known that is a socio-technical system. You've got air traffic controllers dealing with it, pilots, technology, etc. A complex socio-technical system making sure planes arrive and take off um, safely. These systems are so complicated, of course, that you've got lots of uncertainty, inevitable uncertainty. And the fact that you've got humans and the organizations in which they work complicates matters enormously. Human beings are not, not inanimate objects. They, they complicate matters. And don't forget another word, the culture in which we operate. Oh, workplace culture. I'm sure all of us have had plenty of um, opportunities to discuss this with colleagues and perhaps all, if there's one thing I've learned, Everybody's trying to change the workplace culture, right? So obviously it's something that matters, but I'm not sure people truly understand what that would involve. Very simply put, there's the hazards in these uh, socio-technical systems, and a hazard is something that can cause injury, but doesn't have to, injury or harm, doesn't have to. The idea goes, identify the hazards, um, then assess their impacts, mitigate where needed. It's so simple. But the thing is, hazards are everywhere. They're everywhere. From the look at an airport, from the layout of them, the intersection, uh, sectoring runways, etc., where possibly two planes could be at the same time. It could be the procedures operated, say, when bad weather strikes or as a extra high wind. Most importantly, human performance uh, is a very, very tricky one. Um, if you think noise, lighting, et cetera, 
don't impact on your performance, ask the students when they're taking their exams and there's somebody drilling next door. Oh, it affects uh, how they perform. And then you've got organizational factors where, of course, every organization says safety is their number one priority and then decides to give dividends to shareholders rather than spending money on safety training programs. <laughs> Luckily, we've got a safety management systems in place which tell us how to a systematic approaches to managing safety. So you think, okay, great. What's the problem? Well, identify the hazards should be available uh, easily enough. And I'm going to add one other aspect, and, and this to my friends and benefactors in the Lloyd's Register Foundation is something I have understood over a decade and a half. For those of us who research safety in transport organizations, it's not enough to write clever algorithms. Perhaps you have done that. Write elegant and large theses, and, and let's face it to my former PhD students, you have written some <laughs> large and elegant theses in the past. <laughs> and it's no good to say, well, you know, this will make the world a better place. Oh, yes, yeah, some nebulous intentions. Oh, yes, of course, this uh, equation will make the world. No. Anybody working in safety research must, m must, and I, I emphasize it twice, show that the world is going to be a better place uh, than before, and lives will be saved. Also, otherwise, it's just an interesting exercise. Might as well have you know, collided some protons or into whatever they collide protons into in physics. Anyway, because we don't want repeats of, of what you're seeing there. We don't want another Ladbrook Grove. We don't want another Costa Concordia, all of which leads to fatalities, and when you look through the inquiries, you think, well, things could have been done to say, stop this. We could have made this better, and we didn't. So now, having explained that to you, let's get to the meat of the presentation today. And this asks, I'm going to show you three things here through a range of work that the researchers I've worked with have uh, shown me over the years and, and influenced. What are the problems we face? What can we as civil engineers do about it? And how well do we work effectively with other disciplines, whether it's medicine or whether it's the social sciences? So let us begin with the problem that pretty much all of us working in safety faces, or in anything, data. How hard can it be to get data, right? You think, this world is full of Data science centers, yet another call for a big data. And yet, actually, I'm going to tell you, for those of us who work with humans and organizations, it's not true that the data exists. And even when it does, it's not particularly useful in telling us why something happened. It's just data. And somehow we magically think, rather like alchemy, that if we have lots and lots of data and do lots and lots of stats, somehow the world will be a better place for it and people won't die. May maybe, but no, I've not seen that happen. So, okay, you might say, but surely the data exists. Yes, it does. This is a very simple one. A couple of my researchers have looked in the past at general aviation aircraft, small planes, small private planes landing, and this is work we're doing with the Canadians which said that, look, most of the accidents that happen are when these planes are about to land, right? The pilot tends to misjudge the landing, um, look through the safety data and find out why they're doing it, all right? And the Canadians, very good database, they, they keep everything well. Now I'm going to show you something here, what it actually looks like when you're trying to analyze it. Yeah, you're not meant to read in detail, but there's just two accidents there that show you. It's the narrative which will tell you why. And look how variable they are. Look how one tells you a conversation. The other one says, oh, yeah, this, this happened. How on the earth are we supposed to work out why the pilot did what they did? Why did they misjudge the landing? This is simply not adequate enough. 
oh, yeah, the data exists. People will say, well, why don't you do some stats on it? But will we be able to prevent another? Nope. Then we go and say, well, hold on. There's even one more problem with such data. Theory tells us, a theory says, well, actually, you know what? The theoretical pyramid says, first, there's a causal chain. You have a certain number of unsafe acts, leads to a smaller number of minor injuries. One of these will be a fatality. If you manage to stop, find out the factors that lead to that unsafe acts, will prevent the injury, it's the accident. It's logical. You think, yeah, I understand that. This is work which was done by a researcher on ports. Nope, no evidence to show that there's any kind of pyramid. Now, does that mean that um, the theory is wrong, or is it that people don't report? If people don't report, then we get to a culture of an organization. Um, or is it the, the nagging feeling that in complex social technical systems as transport operations, accidents that happen do so in complex, unpredictable, emergent um, manner. And that's something we need to really bear in mind. Now, that's where the data existed, right? What happens where data doesn't exist? So, <coughs> Fort Lauderdale Airport, early January 2017, somebody flies in from Alaska with a handgun, they're, they're allowed under federal regulations, goes to the toilet, loads up the handgun, comes out, and in 83 seconds, shoots dead five people. That's it. Now, you can think, oh, well, not another shooting in the US. That happens so regularly, how terrible. But hey, that's what happens. Or we can say, as safety researchers, how do we try and prevent and minimize such accidents? Well, again, work done here showed amazingly shootings at terminals, at fire evacuations, etc., are not covered fully by aviation and regulations. So, in order to find out about this, um, a researcher went through online access, online articles, Google articles, etc. We even looked at Twitter to try and find out information and followed a systemic pattern to try and build a database of such events. But Google, Wiki, they're reliable, are they? Um, how are we going to check that this data is good quality? So first, this is how it looks. First, you do the search. Then you build a database. Some of it is textual. Some of it is numerical and categorical. Once you've managed to do all that, then, then you can start looking at, well, what's causing all these evacuations? Was it firearm? Was it security? Was it uh, fire, etc.? Only now can you start thinking about statistical testing, and you're limited. You're limited here because there's just not enough of the data. But this is actually one of the first databases to look at what happens when you've got such uh, events in an airport, when you have to evacuate partially or fully. Now, here's another one, a great dilemma of our times where we don't have data. The unfortunate fact about this world is there are going to be people who are displaced for reasons where their life is at stake. Horrendous, unfortunately, if there's one thing that's been pretty constant is people have the ability to do horrendous things to other people. And as long as that happens, there will always be the need for displaced persons to find a place of refuge. But how did they make the decision to travel as they, as they do? It's an interesting question because uh, ultimately, aid agencies need to know where they're going to go to, right? Because that's where the relief operations will come. 
Now, there are computational models out there which helps them. But a good look at one of these will show you, actually, there's so many assumptions made. Computation, uh, computer experts know nothing of the uh, people involved. So they make assumptions about various inputs, following this distribution, that distribution. So one of my researchers recently took on a, a task which has taken over a year with a linguist from Queen Mary as part of the work we've done here um, to look at refugee transcripts and find out from them the quality of the data involved. I show that on the left-hand side to show you that this, again, very much like the work that was done on the active shooter, is, is not straightforward. You have to sit down, you have to reflect, you have to think about the biases that are in the transcripts, you know, uh, refugees who've escaped lives and want um, to have a residence in another country do really need to m m outline how horrific their situation was in their home place and the, the arduous tra uh, travels they had to do. But look, you've got to remove the bias, the, you've got to be reflective in your account. This is not straightforward five, 10 minutes of a word search uh, uh, data mining of these transcripts. You've got to read transcript after transcript. So, this slide shows a number of papers there, and I'm very glad, all the way from Mary Dominique to uh, Haynes, whose paper came out today, mine on the refugees, to show you this is how long. This is not to show you how many papers we've done. This is to show you it's taken us over a decade over a decade and a bit of thinking about how do we get data from sources that are not traditional sources, from transcripts, from, from a number of uh, databases where narratives are look, looked at. I, I did a rough count. I think if we looked at it, maybe about 40,000 incidents have been looked at over the last 12 years. It's not, it's not a trivial task, but it gives you one thing that's really important, data you can believe in to do the next step of the analysis. And I, I'd like to thank all of them, all of my researchers here, some who are watching online, some who are here present, for their contributions in building and building and building in this field. But perhaps we should start, <laughs> yeah, perhaps we should start from a different location. So again, one of my researchers worked with the Sports Ground Safety Authority. England is very lucky in we've got a regulator who regulates sports ground safety. And they asked at the time to look at um, <clears throat> the data they collect for spectator injuries during their matches. It's a fascinating uh, project and the report the researchers concluded was pretty much very well what you've done, but you're kind of collecting the wrong data for the forms you've got. If you, what is it you want to collect? What do you already have out there, such as medical data? And then, why not redesign the form to collect the data you want to collect to answer the questions that need to be answered? And, and with uh, all due credit to the Sports Ground Safety Authority, they were happy to take that on. Um, COVID struck, and if it hadn't, Manchester City, in their efforts to look after the community, would have taken this on. And if maybe they have already started again. But football moves on quickly, so the money probably set aside for this has gone on Haaland's salary, so perhaps not. Anyway. Never mind, but this is a good point. Ask yourself a question. What is the data you're trying to collect and why? And then design your forms around it. Don't try and fit it onto something that was relevant 10 years ago or something like that, which is quite often what we see. Ah, okay, let's see if we can start this video. Let me tell you something else that's quite interesting here. Move the videos.
now. Do you know how the video starts? Okay. Oh. <laughs> it's just going to show you a, a dark, warm night in Taiwan, uh, driving around there. But I think uh, when we get there, ah, uh -huh, great. So it is a, a late night in Taiwan. It's dark. Watch the driver, bus driving you around. Oh, should I go here? Should I? And then the driver remembers their route, does a really sharp turn, and comes in. And you think, okay, no chance he was tired. Oh. Yeah, poor driver behavior. So, <coughs> um, why do we see such poor driver behavior? Well, it can happen for many reasons. It can happen because we're tired and don't get any sleep, or don't get enough sleep and sleep of adequate quality. Anybody have that problem? I do. <laughs> oh, okay, wonderful. You're not alone, huh? So, so what I say is, okay, so how, how does it work then? Um, currently, what do we do for, for bus drivers or any kind? The United Kingdom sets uh, a standard, which I think is followed elsewhere, working time limitations. It says something like, this is how many hours you should drive, or fly a plane, or whatever, and these are the times you should have your brakes, and if you do that, there won't be a crash. Right. But I'm telling you, it could be because my sleep is bad. So, even if I drive in those hours and have my breaks. My sleep is bad. I think you're missing the point here. All right. <laughs> um, what can you do about it? And this, this is quite interesting. There was a st study done in, the, in Australia where it looked at commercial drivers and found like half of them nearly had some kind of sleep apnea-based problem. You know, snoring, too much, partial obstruction of the airway, et cetera. So half the drivers have a sleep problem, but we're hoping that by giving them breaks after three hours, that's going to solve. I would suggest to you, how about we try the sleep treatment? How about we give them something to help them with longer sleep and better quality sleep? Uh, the CPAP machines are an example, or if, if needed, surgery might be an answer. So this is work with the medical schools of Taiwan, which one of my researchers is undertaking, saying, well, let's find out for drivers in a real condition, not a simulated lab, how, how is it? What's it like? Uh, what are their physiological signals when they're driving? And how about their sleep, et cetera? And at the same time, we're going to have something, a little app put into the uh, driver's cab to show how many times they're driving, um, how poorly, shall we say, excessive braking, excessive speeding, etc. And then just, just normally, work normally, right? So this is the kind of kitting up you have to do. There's the mobile app, there's the watch in your hand, heart rate monitors, etc. Dash cam telling you what to do, right? And you're doing that in both city buses and long distance buses. If anybody thinks, how difficult can this be? They've never set up an experimental scenario in a real time in a, a city like Taipei, which is busy, etc. Um, now, 
you collect all this information, etc., in real time, and you think, okay, how do we analyze it? Now, here comes the beautiful part of it, that we're doing, we're collecting all that data during the driving task. Heart rate monitors, you, you're making sure the noise is not canceling out any worthwhile data. You're collecting related data from the environment. What's the weather like? What's the level of congestion? And then you're also asking the drivers, what was your quality of sleep, etc.? What's your uh, travel history? Now, using all that data, we move to trying to predict whether driver errors will happen. And I put the box in green because I wanted to show my colleagues, I just, it's not just qualitative work I do. There you are. Support vector machines and random forests and uh, gated uh, recurrent unit analysis. Dare I say it, isn't that sort of stuff like machine learning and neural networks and all of these? So there you are. We can use sensor data collected in real time. Tricky to do. You can ask the drivers how they are feeling. You can put all that information in and then use some of the most sophisticated techniques coming up to analyze what the drivers will do. And this is not just ordinary. This is for the bus network or the taxi network. And now we're going to try to look at motorcyclists as well in a country where, in, in Asia, where motorcycles are, are uh, such a crucial part. So it's a lot of things put together to make this work. Um, huh. God forbid we have one of those terrorist attacks. Hostile emergencies are another one. And here now, I've shown you the new technology and the new techniques. Let me show you another one coming up. We've seen this one, uh, terrible events at London Bridge. Perhaps people didn't notice in Duisburg, I think in March, five people were stabbed to death in a German city. I mean, what is going on? Um, but you say, well, look, let's look at the data and try and do it. And maybe security services do that, et cetera. But it's actually very difficult to get the data or it doesn't exist and you don't have the various viewpoints. But you really do need this data on how people behave when a terrorist attack happens. Because once you have that, then you can develop models which will enable you to uh, understand how people should best behave and, and what they can do to protect their lives, maybe help the emergency services. But one of my researchers uh, did his PhD on this, and I actually did a sort of surrogate knife attack um, in, in the sports hall here at Imperial. But it takes an awful long time to do that, six months of logistical planning. And ethics, correctly in my view, because you don't want to harm the participants, took an enormous amount of time, a huge amount of effort and time goes to just doing it. And on the day itself, the equipment might not work, that you won't be able to record everything. But look, it's possible if you're willing to take a bit of time. But what about this? Um, Virtual reality, can't we do that? Or we hear all this promise of virtual reality to be the answer. So um, let's see if this will work. If I can ask my, yeah. So this is what it's like, you walk in there. See, it's all, you're walking around and you, you've looked at the part. Is this one got the sound or off? Yeah. Uh, okay. So if you play, so so there are uh, there is uh, distressing language, shall we say? That's why the sound has to be off here. Yeah. But if you play it, please. This is from the point of yeah, one of the participants. The attacker is attackers coming, etc. And people are going to hide. Is 
they're running around. Yeah? What you saw in the sports hall was replicated in virtual reality. It's much quicker to do. It takes a lot less ethics. Uh, and very importantly, we assessed people's fear. Were the two experiments the same? Did you really feel you were threatened here? And we did that through both self-assessed and cortisol uh, reactions. Actually, we found people were afraid, as long as you believe the avatars, right? You've got to do that. It's, it's a very, you've got to believe it's, so the trick is, it's not going to be so believable you think it's a game, but it's believable enough to make you afraid, okay? So, VR could well be the answer. I, I hope so, because that's where a lot of my research is going into, trying to use VR to look at how we could uh, what to do when we have terrorist attacks uh, and, or life-threatening situations or when um, we can ha also help the emergency services. Now, another very interesting part here is to do with the visually impaired. I told you uh, we would look at people. Transport, uh, I would say, for all the good we do, and all the wonderful words we say about accessibility sometimes fails to live up to its promise when it comes to certain marginalized groups. And the visually impaired are amongst those who suffer, I would say, the most. Uh, the number of visually impaired is increasing in the UK and will, will increase more. Um, and it's extraordinary. Only 25% of them are employed, which makes it really tricky for them to be full participants in our society, which is completely at odds at, at how we should be looking at this world. So, a visually impaired student took this on as a PhD, recognizing that there's a wide spectrum of impairments possible out there. Devised a, a novel indoor navigation system based on uh, requirements, God forbid, we, we asked visually impaired people what their requirements were. I mean, we'd never done that before. And uh, gave them back, I would say, some control here, some, some mobility in their lives. A smart cane, a, a, a very clever way of looking at it, working with we walk, we walk a smart cane, working with... Uh, Professor Ocheng, these navigation skills, et cetera, to try and look at how we can bring mobility back to a community that has it curtailed. Now, it's not that simple. I, I, I think you thought I would say that it isn't that simple. Because if you want to set up an experimental work, it's tough enough doing experimental work with the uh, visually unimpaired. Imagine trying to do that kind of experimental work with people with any kind of impairment, right? So a separate, so a whole experimental test bed was designed, which took into account such aspects as turns, diagonals, and tested a variety of visual impairments. Um, if you can start the experiment. So if you see what it actually involves. And stop. Yeah. And stop. Now it's a e to e. straight section. Yeah. And stop. Now back to the And stop. Now T back to A. So there you see it. Experimentation with the visually impaired. It's it's taking it to a different level, right? But that wasn't where we stopped it, because we actually also asked the visually impaired, tell us about what it's like to navigate through a number of environments, both 
indoors and outdoors. Extraordinary because the literature showed nobody had ever asked them. What they've, uh, I don't know why, but nobody had ever asked them. What are the um, factors you face when you have to negotiate env environments based on your experience? And here I take uh, my cue from my social science colleagues because we followed a, a, thematic, pro a thematic analysis pr process, coding the various interviews. <sighs> there was a lot of material to properly code and analyze the various themes. But it, what it showed us was there were various aspects, quite, quite refined into looking at you know, what it's like to, to navigate around in a restaurant, a small restaurant as opposed to a large restaurant, a cinema hall, what are the obstacles of walking on flat ground as opposed to uh, uneven ground, etc. So it's not just the experiments, which are in themselves very, very interesting and difficult to do. It's also matching it with the social sciences to find out what exactly they say are their experiences. So <coughs> one of my students actually told me this about a decade ago. She said, actually, this is how you should do this analysis. First, you should do the literature. Then, you should observe people at work, okay, or doing whatever. Then you should interview them. Having done all that, do the qualitative analysis, and then do the quantitative analysis. I do think myself guilty. We've tended to go as quickly as possible to quantitative without thinking about actually to do it properly in a complex socio-technical system where humans are involved with organizations and processes, this is the way to do it. And if you look back on the way we've done these things, that's the way we've done it. So it, it did matter a lot. Can we transfer this to teaching? It's all well and good doing research, but what about the future? This is about the future, right? Um, yes, I think we can. Uh, over the summer, I'm building a, a VR lab with students looking at the built environment. It's got a potential, we want to use it for teaching, but it's got to be carefully designed. It's not a game. We're talking about using virtual reality to teach concepts, not to have fun and, and play around. That requires careful thought. A first search shows us it's never been tried before. People have used VR to give people experience, students, but to actually use it for full learning will require thought. We can work with other fields in a um, multidisciplinary manner. Uh, I've shown you, we worked with the social sciences, the medics, et cetera. And, and medicine is actually quite an interesting one. Um, <coughs> I, I work with colleagues in the medical schools at Imperial, developing joint lectures on reporting and safety culture. Now, it's really interesting. I used to think, well, transport has this problem, work culture. Wait till you see the medical field. They don't call it safety, it's whistleblowing. As soon as you use terms like that, you know there's a problem. But they're very happy, and it's too sensitive to them. Medical uh, negligence or, or work culture. But they're quite happy to see how transport works and learn the lessons from the culture there. And the one good thing I will say about medical students, they look at every accident report as if it was a case study. So they're very forensic. They can tell you what's wrong straight away. Um, so there is an opportunity here to work across the fields and uh, transfer it. And, and we do that with one of my former students. We do have a Science of Crowds course about how people interact, react, and move in crowds. And, and this involves imperial students, not just from engineering, but from medicine, from the natural sciences as well so that they work together. And now we're going to put the VR lab in for them to work with. There's a great opportunity to see interdisciplinary work from a young, from the second year of their degree, not uh, someone like myself who came into this very late and had to learn everything all over. Ah, I'm coming to the end. So I had to say, Washington said, I did air traffic controller workload. I'm sure some of you would have thought, what, you don't do workload anymore? Well, I could say my workload is so high, I don't have time to do work on workload anymore. But 
No, I do, I do, I, I still. Workload was my first contact with psychology, social sciences, because the word construct came up. I've never heard of such a thing before. What, what's a construct? Uh, something, I had it best explained when somebody said to me, um, it's not something you can touch and feel. You, you can't get a pint of workload, right? I said, oh, okay, it's not like that. Here's a pint for you. It's something you have to infer, okay? And then words like phenomenological came out. That's not easy to say. But I began to understand this is a domain that's almost alien, but we can't ignore it. And the problem was, at the time, workload limits in airspace capacity um, meant that it was limiting airspace, and especially over Europe. And at the time, a referee on a paper had said to me, what's your definition of workload? And once you've defined it, how are you going to measure it? And once you've measured it, what's an acceptable level? Because there are as many writers as there are definitions, as different measurements. And I thought, oh my god, this is a world I don't understand. I understand trip modeling, et cetera, all of that. This is, uh, and the advice given at the time was just acknowledge it, but not for your PhD to do it. Um, and in those days, people used questionnaires and observations, right? I did some work with <laughs> Icelandic colleagues, which is really interesting. They used a voice measurement, a microphone. Because that tell, that's a reflexive. You can't hide your stress and workloads when you, for your voice. What was unique about this was I worked with an electrical engineer and a cognitive psychologist. I've shown you the diagram to show you how tricky the actual process is with students and pilots. Basically, the psychologist set them up to read the Stroop test, psychological Stroop test where you have to do at shorter intervals. And the electrical engineer was very, spent his time trying to cut out the noise from the frequency signals. Then I realized it sounds easy to do, but you really do need to take very great care to have results which are valid and can be believable. And it's a real experience and appreciating others. Now, we're doing even more. We're kitting up our students and, and other researchers with EEG equipment, et cetera, seeing their brain waves as they do tasks, right? There we are. I've gone away from questionnaires. <laughs> questionnaires are still valuable. Let me point that out. Uh, I don't think we should ignore them. The subjective element. But we, we are seeing, there you are. Isn't that a skill of an engineer to know how to use new technologies and how best to use them? This is, it gives an, an extra dimension. And, and people will say to me, yeah, but you can't do that because it's measuring human beings. So you don't have a Fitbit, something that gives you the step counter on your phone. Quite happy to give that to Apple, all that information. But unhappy to do this? Mm. Now, so let me end here by going to talk a little bit about the task ahead. And I'm, I'm going to make this as sort of like a manifest. What should we do for the future? Because in a decade or so, my time will be up in this one. But I really want to go before then to establish a culture of uh, interdisciplinary appreciation for safety. I don't mean that simply by saying, yeah, we should work with people who are social scientists, medics, etc. I've shown you, yes, we should. But it's not going to be easy, because they will follow different paradigms. They, they, the care they take is different from the care we take, but it's care nonetheless to make their results valuable and valid. So really, and I, I showed you at the beginning, we're supposed to have skills in social sciences, etc. I didn't have any. Didn't have any. So perhaps we should need to educate earlier. Um, respect, one of the biggest things over the last decade has been to understand and respect other fields their methodologies. It's not ours. And I put my hand up. There was a time when, because I could do some spatiotemporal statistics and other things like that, I felt vastly superior to anybody who did any interviews because I was quantitative, right? I'm clever because I've 
been able to build these clever models. No, I think that's, I hope my colleagues from the social sciences and medicine uh, appreciate that that's not at all how I feel. Every field is complicated. Every field has its own way of doing it. We don't have to be experts. I'm not a psychologist, but I've studied psychology. I'm, I'm not one of the methodologies, but I understand and respect it. If you don't do that, we can't solve some of the problems. Uh, I think we need to implement. I mean, uh, virtual reality has its potentials. Um, artificial intelligence, hardly a day goes by before we're told we're going to be taken over by unseen robots, etc. I'm a little bit optimistic about this in the sense that I've shown you we can stop bus drivers from crashing late at night because they're tired in Taiwan. I showed you that. We can, do, we can do all sorts of things here. And I also take heart that there are plenty of very good ethicists who are working on understanding the ethics involved in such machines. And to, it's not my business to do that, but my business to recognize we can do what we can do. Please leave the, them to give their part of it right, and work with them. Um, I think for those of us who are engineers, and perhaps Washington US head of the department know this, but <laughs> well before, we'll perhaps take it on. Do, do tell us, that, get us ready for those kind of skills we haven't had in the past, right? We've talked a lot about having those skills, and yet focused on being better at fluid dynamics than ever before, or nonlinear, stochastic, uh, nonlinear structural methods, but actually that's you know, not what engineers, not the only things engineers do. And we, the engineers, civil engineers, need to tell others what we do and how we do them so well. And in return, other fields need to understand what we're doing, and, and many, many do when, when it comes to such aspects as sustainability, public health, but there's a bigger world out there to do, to look at this. And I think this is an agenda, if some of this can be fulfilled, I think we'll be much, we'll be much better on our way to the solving the world's problems. I always say this, and I think people think, oh yeah, but you're an academic who's gone up the ladder, hitting metrics left, right, and center. But for those of you who have worked with me before, will know that, yeah, of course it's important and it's interesting to have H indices of God knows what, or, or papers and prizes and grants. But really, that was never the motivation. It really was about making the world a better and a safer place. By doing that, the others will come. It's, it's hard to say when I was younger, I didn't believe that, but it really does matter. And I think I've been very fortunate to work with many of you who also have believed that. And finally, I'd like to say my thank yous because it's important. Uh, I've been here since 91, so you couldn't say my rise was meteoric, right? <laughs> but slow and steady wins the race, as they say. Um, I'd like to thank the very many researchers I've worked with, personally, or many of my PhD students are here. I hope uh, I've reflected on your work, and, and some whom I haven't mentioned, please forgive me on that, but that's not to say the work you've done every day has affected me. It's never been one-sided. The ideas you've come up with, the, the arguments you've had with me about it have all had an enormous influence in my thinking, evolving and understanding better. Uh, I'd like to thank colleagues in the Center for Transport Studies. Um, I've known four or five different directors from Professor Ridley, who was a great um, inspiration, the late John Polak, who I got to know well, a man of incredible contrast, whom I appreciated well. Uh, Washington, I don't need to tell you how much I owe you, but in case I do need to tell you, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, uh, from two things, uh, when I nearly gave him my, my PhD on the train journey back from Bournemouth after a pretty difficult day, when you persuaded me to stay on, and then during my difficult start to a lectureship when you told me to keep persevering. So thank you very much. I think you know how much I owe you to Dan. You're the last in a, in a long line, and I'm sure you'll succeed very well, and you have my full support in making the CTA, 
whatever we call ourselves, the, the, rest, the rest that is. Um, and I'd like to thank the Department of Civil Engineering. I have many friends and colleagues here. We just occasionally run into each other in the corridor complaining about the very poor leadership we're faced with on a daily basis. <laughs> and yet then go back to giving it all for that department and the leader who's, <laughs> who leads it. So there we are. The fact that we, we go back tells you how much we love this place. Um, when it comes to sponsors, there can be no doubts, uh, and Jan, you're here, how much I owe the Lloyd's Register Foundation, how much so many people, you know, um, literally is so, so many who owe the, the few of their Lloyd's Register Foundation because one thing that you have given us is the freedom to work, to, to be, the experience of running teams, the experience of coming up with research agendas, the experience of actually forcing us to make the world a better place, always asking, but is it better than it was before? And uh, from the many directors, from the Lloyd's Register Education Trust to today, I, I am really grateful, as I'm sure many of the PhD students are, and we hope we've made the LRF a very proud organization. And also, I don't see anybody from Eurocontrol. Oh, I do, I do, I see you. Uh, Eurocontrol, in the early days, and further on, was very instrumental in setting up the work on looking at airspace capacity and safety. And um, it's a great pity things happened. Well, we all know what happened in 2016 that led to this uh, relationships being put on hold. Let's hope things will change. Um, I'd like to, to thank all my colleagues, many of you may be listening today globally around the world. I'm very fortunate to work with people all the way from Australia, all the way around to um, the Atlantic coast of Canada and North America. Um, I learn a lot. I've, I've got better at working with people and really enjoying it because the days are there when I just learn from the moment I get up to, till I get to sleep, I always think I've learned something that I didn't know before and that's got to be our task. Uh, finally, let me end by thanking my family. I think for my father, we did, I remember very well, we came with three pounds in our pocket. So, you know, trying to, trying to get them to pay me to buy some football cards was a really tough task, a really tough task. Um, but I, I thank them. Uh, my mother, who's not here, she was what you'd describe today as a tiger mother, right? Bearing her teeth when needed and not, not needed either, I think, at times. But anyway, look, uh, she's not, she died a decade ago. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for her bearing her teeth <laughs> when it was needed. And I'm thankful to my sister, my wife, and my son for uh, their support and guidance and helping me when I get a little bit frustrated, which can happen. <laughs> And uh, to my broader family elsewhere, uh, who are probably listening in, all the way from India to California, um, it's been wonderful. And above all, thank you for coming. I've really enjoyed this opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we have time for a couple of questions, because I promised it at the beginning. That's what I call a tour de force. Um, what can I say? It's multi helix stakeholders, mixed methods, quite a significant level of pragmatism and practical challenges involved to make a safer world, or to engineer a safer world. I also took from that it's safety for all, the entire demographic strata of the world's population. No mean feat, so thank you very much. Uh, one question online and one in the room. Professor Peter Jones. There's a microphone just there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arnav. I was, that was very comprehensive, very lucid, and al although we've worked together, 
across colleges. I hadn't really appreciated the, you know, the breadth and, and, and the richness of what you've done. So thank you very much for giving the opportunity to understand a little bit about what you've achieved in your life so far and what you're going to go do in the future. One thing, topic you didn't mention, obviously you can't mention everything, was the whole thing about driver assist in autonomous vehicles. And I don't know if this has got at the top of your list yet, but I was thinking that, as you said about driver t fatigue, the, more, the less the driver has to do and the more monotonous the environment, the less alert they are. And as driver assistance improves and they get more autonomy, not more of the time, the vehicle will look after itself. And it's only in extreme situations that the driver is expected to take over. So in a situation where when it's more automated, the driver is less alert. And as these machines get more sophisticated, it's only in the extreme cases that requires a higher level of alertness that the driver is expected to take over. Do you think that's a chasm that's not crossable? Or have you thought about doing some research in that area? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Peter. So I have very, very capable colleagues who look at autonomous vehicles, so I've tended to leave. What I will say is this. Uh, I've, I've watched trials in air traffic control rooms, etc., which is all very automated. The real problem happens if something goes wrong because you've got a de-skilled person whose, whose workload and whatever will go like from this up to there. I've seen air traffic controllers in trials strug struggle with that because they're doing nothing, chatting with each other. Suddenly something's gone wrong and then they've had to react quick. Now, the, the airspace still gives you some volume of airspace. I wonder always what happens if something goes wrong in Piccadilly Circus on a, on a busy day with one or two uh, vehicles, etc. when somebody who hasn't driven for ages suddenly has to try and get out of this. What I've also understood, and, and uh, having looked at lawyers, etc., it's <laughs> there are many, many other steps to come along into that uh, not only the understanding this, but what happens? Who's going to be legally responsible for these aspects? So there is a, a domain there. I think there's been tremendously good work on, on the algorithms involved. There's been all sorts of work on the vehicles, the human factors. But it's what, what happens when something goes wrong? And how quickly do you expect us to be able to fix that? I think we haven't looked at that in the depth that's required. Yeah. I agree with you. That's something we should should be and probably will be once <laughs> these vehicles come onto the road. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, Dan, any? Yes, no, first of all, there's a lot of people online and they've really enjoyed the talk. Oh, so thanks. you're not alone with just us in the room. <laughs> but there is a question from S. Basharan. Okay. And he's saying that collaborating on analysis with professionals from other fields uh, yeah. presents several challenges. Absolutely. And he was wondering if you would like to say something about those challenges and how you've managed to work through them. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, every field, every field has different paradigms and assumptions, right? Um, that, you know, those who are engineers or natural physicists or whatever, we're used to doing what we're doing and we've built on this. Understanding what the other field does, does require a lot of work. Not just hours of meetings, but maybe reading up as well, understanding, um, you know, when I, when I took on this list role and, and increased it, I, I was busy trying to understand what the sociologists say, sociologists, you know, from Durkheim to um, Marx to all of it. But it was, it was completely new language. So you've got to spend time and effort understanding, but I do also think it, it comes from respecting the other field, understand their methodologies, but also make sure they understand yours. So there are challenges there. I've shown you today that it's not going to happen overnight. If, if, if you give a diktat and say, in six months I want interdisciplinary work all across the universities of the UK, I would suggest to you, well, that's, you know, you'll get the wording, but not true interdisciplinarity, not true understanding. So I think Give it time to understand what's involved here. Um, and try and understand the other topics as well. And make sure they understand back. That I think is very important. Thanks. Yeah? Thank you very much. You can rest your feet now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.
So it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Kai Haxhausen. Um, I knew of Kai a long time ago. So his trajectory, at least as far as I know, started here at Imperial College, then went to ETH Zurich, Singapore, and all of those different places, also making a difference in transport globally. So it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Professor Kai Haxhausen to give a vote of thanks. Kai. Round of applause, please. Thanks, uh, Washington, for inviting me. Thanks, Arnab, for giving this really interesting, comprehensive talk. And I think it was really interesting to see how his trajectory matches, I think, the trajectory of the field overall. Because he started with a traditional definition, which kind of stayed with the hardware. And it has been hard for all these engineers to understand that actually the value added is actually in the operations. If you look at most buildings, the total value add is, happens after you finish it because you have to reconstruct it, rebuild it, change it again and again. And that's where modern engineering really adds the value. And I think this trajectory from Hardware, he started as a pavement designer, road designer, to actually operating and thinking about how we operate our roads, and by extension, all the other systems he got an interest in, I think is for us typical for what engineering subjects should do. Yes, we have to know about the hardware, but we have to think about how we operate it, and how this operation then interacts with society, and how we interact with the others interested in the infrastructure, but also in the interactions, the operations, and the societal impacts we will have. And with that, I think an apro, some drinks are waiting outside for us. Before we say thank you for that, I would like to say thank you one more time to Anup and to the department. So uh, just to say on behalf of Imperial College London, the president of Imperial College, on behalf of the dean of the Faculty of Engineering, uh, Professor Nigel Brandon, on behalf of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, I'd like to thank you most sincerely for coming today and joining us on this uh, auspicious occasion. So we do have a drinks reception outside. Um, Professor Majumda is happy to take pictures to pose with you and so on during the drinks. So please join us outside for our drinks reception. And after that, a very, very safe journey home. So thank you very much indeed. Outside. Thank you. Good, you're growing on. 